everyone, I'm Gina. I'm a registered dental hygienist. I've been in practice for about 10 years. And I'm Luke. I'm a dentist and Gina's husband. And I've been a dentist for eight years now. And we've been practicing together for that entire time. We have an office in Linwood, Washington, and that is about 15 minutes north of Seattle. So today, our topic of conversation will be occlusion. Woo. <laughs> so every day we have patients coming in and they either have broken teeth, loose teeth, migrating teeth, or even TMJ pain uh, in addition to yep. attrition. And so um, we want to talk about what causes it and what we do about it. Before we get started on that, I just wanted to introduce two different concepts that'll be really important to understanding what we're gonna be talking about today. The first concept is called centric relation, and that has entirely everything to do with your joints themselves. So the temporomandibular joint is, is made up of the mandibular condyle, and that fits perfectly into the glenoid fossa on both sides. And when that condyle is completely seated into the uppermost position, that's called centric relation. The other concept is called uh, maxim, maximum intercuspation. And that's where, when I tell a patient to bite together, that's where when all the teeth come together all at once. Uh, in an idealized occlusion, we want centric relation and maximum intercuspation to be at the exact same joint position. So you'll get a little anatomy lesson today, remembering your uh, mandibular condyles, your glenoid fossa, yep. and we'll show you all about it in op here in just a minute. I'll be Luke's patient. He'll be kind of explaining what he's doing as he goes um, so that we can explain how we fi find out if there is an imbalance in occlusion and what to do about it um, to help a patient have the best dental outcomes that they can have. So if you want to come with us, we'll head over to the op and we'll get going. Let's do it. So Hi. Luke, hey. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit more about how you would find out whether a patient has an uh, imbalance with their occlusion. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways that I like to figure that out. The first one is by interviewing the patient, looking at their health history. Um, a patient may come in and, and tell me that they get clicking or popping in their jaw joints. They may notice, you know, muscle soreness or headaches, or they, their partner may notice um, that they audibly will clench and grind their teeth while they're sleeping at night. Uh, the other way that I determine whether these things are happening is with my complete dental exam. I'm looking for teeth that may be loose. I'm looking for fracture lines in the, the teeth, chipped porcelain, wear of the front teeth. I'm looking for teeth that have shifted since the last time I've seen the patient. Um, and then I'm also palpating the muscles and seeing if, if there's soreness or whether there's clicking or, or popping in the jaw joints themselves. All right, so uh, before we figure out how to treat an occlusal problem, we first have to make sure that the jaw joints are actually healthy and, and can accept the load of someone's bite. Uh, the way that we do that is by load testing the jaw joints, which verifies that Gina's jaw joints can comfortably accept like the load of her chewing forces when in centric relation, which is that uppermost seated position. So I'm gonna recline the chair and we're gonna load test her TMJs to assess their health. How's that headrest for you? Okay. All right, so now I have Gina uh, laid back into a more or less flat position where her um, head and neck is about 90 degrees from my elbows. Um, and then I'll position, this is something that takes years of practice to develop the skills for. Um, I did a lot of training in my dental residency and then I have taken a, like a long series of courses with the Dawson Academy. Um, but this is the, the way that I prefer to load test the jaw joints. And what I'll do is I will take my three, um, my three middle fingers and go on the inferior border of the mandible there. And then with my pinky just slightly back and my uh, thumbs 
down on her chin, and then I'll have Gina, could you open just a little bit for me? And let's just have the, the jaw joint relax. And then in that position, I can really feel her jaw joint hinge open and close. And then I'll, I'm gonna do a little bit of pressure upwards. Gina, do you feel any tension or tenderness when I load test the joints? Not really. Okay. You'll feel where my fingers, you'll feel the pressure of my fingers, but I'm wondering specifically about in this area up here. So I'll do a little bit more pressure. And then from that position, I'm gonna allow Gina's teeth to close until they first, first touch. And um, if, assuming that the load test is negative with, with light, medium, and firm pressure, then we can assume that we're in centric relation. And then from that position, I'm gonna have the teeth close until they first touch. And if they, if everything comes together at the same time, that's great. That means that um, centric relation and maximum intercuspation are the same. If they don't, that first tooth that, that comes together is, a, is an occlusal interference. And what we will usually see from that is that tooth will first hit and then the rest of the teeth will have to, that then the teeth will slide across each other until everything comes together and touches. Um, and what that does is it makes your uh, small positioning muscles of the jaw joint have to work against the, the most strong muscles in your body, which are the masseter, the temporalis, and all those muscles of mastication. And that's what triggers um, the tooth pain and the muscle soreness and all that stuff. What I see a lot of times in my dental practice is the people who do have a lot of those signs and symptoms of occlusal of occlusal problems, um, they'll have really, really tight muscles that, that brace uh, that brace and make it really difficult to reposition them and, and load test the joints and see whether they're healthy because of that muscle activity. So what I'll do a lot of the time in that case is I'll use a Lucia jig. Um, these are, I get from Great Lakes Orthodontics, and it's just a deprogrammer. What it does when I, I'll take a little bit of compound and put it on the programmer, deprogrammer, and then I'll put it on her front teeth. And what that does is allows like a flat plane for her teeth to be able to move all around on. And that encourages the jaw muscles to relax and for me to be able to load test again once the jaw muscles have relaxed so then I can feel what the jaw joints will feel like. So let's let's uh, sit Gina back up and talk a little bit more about what our treatment options are once we've done our diagnosis. All right, so once we've assessed the, the health of the temporary mandibular joints by load testing in centric relation and seeing how the teeth come together um, into maximum intercuspation from centric relation, then we get to the fun part, which is determining what the best course of action is. Um, a lot of people know about night guards uh, a lot of dentists will recommend them if someone's having any sort of jaw pain. Uh, in my practice, I use night guards a fair amount because uh, they're simple, they're relatively inexpensive, they're completely non-invasive, um, and they're also a good diagnostic appliance. When someone does have healthy jaw joints and centric relation, but they don't have a perfected bite, um, we can get a perfected bite of the lower teeth against the night guard by um, making, a, making a night guard that is slightly thicker in the front compared to the back so that when the person closes, they'll have all the teeth hitting against it at once. And then we can make it so that when they go from side to side, their back teeth separate, which tends to help the jaw joints relax as well, just like the D programmer will do as a diagnostic appliance. Uh, and a night guard can be wear, worn for years and years um, with no harm as long as it's made well. If someone um, does have symptoms throughout the day um, or have a lot of those signs and symptoms of, of occlusal problems, uh, before doing any type of treatment, I want to make sure that I've nailed down the diagnosis. Uh, and the way that we do that is by making impressions of the upper and lower teeth. Uh, we take a face bow record and then we take a bite record in centric relation, which allows us to mount, uh, mount models on a semi-adjustable articulator. From there, we can see exactly how those teeth 
are coming together. We confirm that the first tooth that comes together in the mouth when load testing and closing the patient is the exact same as what we see on the models, uh, therefore confirming, you know, confirming that our mounting is correct. And then we can determine what's the most simple way in order to ach achieve an idealized occlusion or bite. Um, the, the different options of how to achieve that are by um, adjusting the person's bite and reshaping the teeth. Um, that's when you're really, really close, but you just have a couple teeth um, that need to be reshaped in order for the teeth to come together. I like to do that on the models before I ever take a hand piece to the patient's mouth because you never want to get in and start adjusting someone's bite and realize that you have to do a lot more than you think you do. Uh, the other option is to reposition the teeth with orthodontics. Um, that can be really helpful if you have some alignment concerns and, um, and the teeth aren't quite close enough together in order to do an equilibration and reshape the teeth. The other option is to do restorative dentistry, which is uh, crowns, composites, bridges, implants, and achieve an idealized bite which we also do on the models. And then if someone's bite is really far off, uh, it may be necessary to do some type of orthognathic surgery. And those are pretty extreme cases and you generally will be able to tell right away before you even mount the models that the upper and lower teeth are so far off from each other, either with an underbite or an overbite. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about how I manage occlusion in my office. It's very, very complicated and spent years learning about this and I'm still learning. The next step for me in my office is gonna be uh, taking this process, which has been analog on articulators for years and years and using my iTero scanner uh, to do the diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment planning for patients. And that's really coming along now. Thank you for spending this time with us today and I hope that you learned a thing or two. Have a good one.